welcome everyone to Studio Soup. A big thank you to Peggy Reevy and Judith Blonick for creating these conversations, this, this event called Studio Soup. I hope many of you have been to Angels Gate Cultural Center in the past when we had chances to be at Angels Gate Cultural Center. And we hope to do that again soon, but we can do that a lot right now through virtual events and um, being a part of our family art workshops that happen every month. If you haven't been to Angels Gate Cultural Center or you don't know us, just want to share a couple things with, uh, with you about us. Um, in the fall here, we'll be doing 70 classrooms worth of virtual arts learning, 12 week programs for them. We also have community classes that have, some of them have moved to um, online. We also have a gallery showing that's going to open um, September 19th virtually. And once we can allow small groups into the gallery, it'll be up until the end of the year, but it will be online virtually for you um, on our website, just like we had uh, Bridging San Pedro, which was our last show, and our Art at Work event. And our studi studio artists are really making work through this um, whole pandemic. You'll get to talk to two of them tonight. Uh, W.S. Milner and June Edmonds have been doing some great things during this pandemic. This event is really about process, so any of the questions you have tonight around process, we'll, we'll try and get involved. And I would like to now introduce to you um, Peggy Reevy, June Edmonds, Wendy Milner, and Eugene Dobb. Enjoy this conversation between colleagues. There they are. Thanks you all for being here. I'll see you later. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Welcome to Studio Soup. My name is Peggy Reevy. Studio Soup is a place where artists get together and talk about their working process. They talk about how they get from a point of just a glimpse of an idea to where they really feel like, yeah, this is how I want this to be. This is what I meant. And this can involve all kinds of things from, uh, you know, starting all over after they've been working on it for a while, changing the materials, re-envisioning, rethinking, retitling, all kinds of things along the way. Today we focus on three gifted and accomplished San Pedro artists, Eugene Dobb, sculptor, June Edmonds, a painter, and W.S. Milner, a sculptor. Later, we're gonna offer you the, their website so you can explore those. They have a lot of impressive information on there. But for now, I just wanna say that these artists are very distinctive, very different from each other, but they share a passion for history. Their imaginations interact with history as they create works that are personal and that speak to, to today, to now. So now I'm gonna begin with a question for you, Eugene. Um, you have created an enormous body of work and a significant amount of that work is done on commission. Um, and I'm really interested to know how it is that when you have been, you were working on uh, something that someone else wanted you to do, someone you may not know at all very well, and they want you to make a sculpture of someone that maybe died before you were born, you never met them, um, and I am just so amazed at how personal this process is, and not only what a personal project this becomes for you, but that people can tell by looking at it that it is personal. What part of the process does this happen in? How does this happen? I think it, it starts right from the very beginning when, um, uh, when it comes in and I, whether I have to um, you know, make a proposal and, and go after the job or whether it comes directly to me, basically the first thing that happens um, is that I start to you know, have this thought process about uh, the people. And I, I think for, uh, just for clarity, I'll, I'll just isolate one. I'll, I'll, I'd Good like idea. to isolate the, the Lewis and Clark project because that was one of my really first large commissions. And it really uh, was such an amazing thing to, to be able to interpret a historical 
context and, and people, you know, like the, uh, the, the four, I mean, there were 50, 50 some people on that, on that uh, expedition, but only four were represented. And that was Lewis, Clark, Sacagawea and York. And every one of them, uh, you know, had a, their own personal vision about what that, what that expedition meant. And so, um, you know, I'm trying to get into their head and, and, and think about what they might be thinking. And, and so it's, uh, I have, in, in this case, the benefit of a full figure so I can not only uh, deal with the, uh, with the expressions, but I can deal with the body language and, and that sort of thing, whatever I can, uh, whenever I can use to manipulate uh, their sense of, of vision or um, um, angst or, or fear or whatever it happens to be. And sometimes it's a combination of things. You know, they all four of them had a, a very different vision. And so it's a little bit like being a, a, maybe a film director or something, you know, trying to, to pose these people in a, in a, in a pose that feels natural for them and feels uh, appropriate. You get emotionally engaged, right? Really kind of fr yeah, all I the do. way along. Yeah, and so I do sketches and then I do little maquette studies and, and I do many, many of them. And, uh, and, and usually the first ones fail utterly. And, and it mm -hmm. just, you know, it just, I just kind of keep building until it works. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes, um, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's committees involved and the committees will have their chance to, to look at it and critique. And, and sometimes I, I agree with them. Sometimes I don't agree with them. Sometimes they have really wonderful suggestions too that, that make it better that I haven't thought of. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a combination. It's a, at that point, it's kind of a, uh, a team thing, you know, yeah, and, uh, well, I, I imagine it's got to be a little bit challenging when someone set, wants you to do something you don't want to do. I'm, I'm hoping that you get to say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I haven't said no very often, but, uh, but every once in a great while. It sounds to me like it's sort of like it becomes yours as soon as you decide to do it. It's your piece, even though you didn't dream it. You didn't decide to do this on your own alone in your studio. It's yours, just like any exactly. other person. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Once, yeah. once you, once you accept it and begin to, um, you know, have ideas about how it needs to be, it, you're right. It's it's completely yours at that point. Yeah. Eugene, I have a question for you. Oh, like, what what jobs are you most excited about? You know, to apply for. Like, which RFQs like are the most exciting for you? And which ones are you not interested in, and you know, why? I, that's a good question. I uh, and I think after after the Lewis and Clark um, commission, which was around um, early to mid '90s, after that, I really fell in love with historical projects. I mean, for me, uh, I just got so into that project. It took years of my life, and and. And I read every book I could on on the expeditions and on their lives and on their experiences and and um, he was even lucky enough to meet Stephen Ambrose and and wow. talk to him about you know uh, his book and 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 so after that I really started to apply only for historical projects for and for historical projects of people that I really thought that I could get into portraying and heroicizing yeah. or or giving the credit that I thought they deserved. Uh -huh. So that's so interesting because it's not like they could sit for you, these historical people. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and so the way you're describing how you're, you get into the story and it's like you're a director, it's like you're creating your, your uh, subjects from the inside out, you know, <laughs> and that's super cool, you know. Yeah, yeah. Spirit, and then out. So that's it. Well, yeah, especially in the case of, you know, older, more historic projects where there weren't, in some cases, in Lewis and Clark, there, there were no photographs. There was Nothing. no photography in those days. They did drawings, though, but yeah. Few, yeah. There was a few, I think, uh, 
uh, what's his name, uh, Peel, Charles Wilson Peel, uh, had done paintings of Clark and, and, uh, and Lewis, but that was it. There was, there was nothing on York, there was nothing on Sacagawea at all. So they, they were complete <laughs> inventions. And the only, the only thing that uh, was kind of interesting about that was, I remember when I was doing Sacagawea, uh, I researched various tribes that, you know, the Shoshone and the Hidatsa, and, and uh, I was lucky enough in that case to have the Smithsonian as a backup. And so they, they sent people to my studio, and the one guy said, you know what, she looks great, but she, her face isn't wide enough. Uh, you know, the Shoshones had much wider cheekbones than that. And so I said, fine. And so I, I corrected it. And I think it, it was a wonderful critique. Sure, sure. You know? So. Well, that's, thank you, Eugene. Sure. I would like to ask June a question. How did you come to make these flags? Because they are, the, the flags that you painted are so powerful. And as, as I've said, they're abstract, but so full of narrative. I just would like to know where that idea come, came from and how you proceeded in your process. Yeah, well, honestly, it came in a dream, okay? So uh, it came in a dream. And I was doing a residency. This is before I moved into Angel's Gate. So in early 2017, I did a residency in Paducah, Kentucky. And so I applied to go to Paducah, Kentucky, you know, in 2015 or 2016. It's a residency uh, that is owned by Alonzo Davis, who used to be here in LA in the Merck Park with his brother, Dale Davis. And so, um, I was there and I thought it'd be okay to go there, but then, you know, uh, we had sort of a, a switching of the guards, if you will, you know, in America. Oh. And so it was a little bit more intimidating for me to go there. I didn't really know if, if I would be safe, mm -hmm. you know, um, but Paducah is, is a pretty, it, it has a, a little bit of a progressive community, but then it's an arts town, so it was cool. But I wanted to go to um, Memphis, Tennessee. You know, I, I really wanted to go. So I went with a friend, we rented a car, and uh, we were on the highway. And so, you know, we saw, you know, many uh, uh, Confederate flags, and, you know, I was always heard about them. You know, I've never lived in the South, you know, so I always had an idea of what it would be like there. And to see these flags, it was, it was pretty um, unnerving, if you will. And so uh, uh, they don't have freeways like the 405 there, you know, they have these highways, small roads, stoplights, you know, so you're really sort of going through these towns and this one town uh, there was a house on the top of the hill and there was a, a huge, uh, again, uh, Confederate flag. So uh, that, it was just very disturbing to me, you know. Uh, it's not like I haven't uh, experienced racism before, but it's it's different out here, the kind of racism that, that we have here. So it being so blatant, I think it just sort of was in my mind and, and months later, you know, I had a dream about these these black flags they were all the way black and um and so when i started painting them um i you know i was like well how do i know their flags and they're they were black you know so i don't know how uh i don't really know why in my dream i interpreted them that way but the first ones were were pretty light you know because i was like oh I, I really want these to look like flags but i used browns and i was i was using a lot of browns and neutral colors uh for skin tones at the time and and so that's how that's how that occurred yeah i always wondered what made you choose the colors so that that is how you know i went to use browns but i was using uh browns that I wanted to be identified with primary colors, you know, so uh, as opposed to the flag being red, white, and blue, I was using red, yellow, and blue. So where uh, the flag has white, I'm using sort of uh, yellowish browns right there. And that's, um, 
sort of uh, terms that we we used. I remember using growing up, and even you know currently, African Americans referring skin tone in those primary colors. So I just kind of thought about that recently, and thought that was really interesting. You know that we refer our own skin tones in these primary colors. They're beautiful. Yes. Thank you, when, thank you WS. <laughs> so, uh, so WS, your mixing of media is so interesting. You know, like when you sort of read the materials that are in your sculptures, it's like, how do you get everything in there? You know, <laughs> uh, clay and paper mache and, you know, all of these things. So what is your process? You know, I'm sure there's some really uh, interesting layering, you know, that you have had to work out for, you know. I'm such a random person. And every time I do something, it ends up being the first time I ever did it. So... <laughs> This, I, you know, it's like I'm always inventing this stuff. So this is an armature of, um, underneath it is stuff that you use on, on drywall. And then I tape over it. And then you can see this piece. This is the side. All these deciduous gods are two-sided. So this is how it ends up looking. But it's layers uh, over, the, um, over the, the tape that you saw. Uh, mm -hmm. I use a, my own kind of, um, well, it's kind of a hard gesso with all kinds of weird stuff in it. Um, and then the final layer on these was um, epoxy, a, an acrylic epoxy. Mm -hmm. So I could go outside. And, and will you put up the third slide too, Colleen? So this is the other side of that same piece. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they were, they were two-sided and... Um, yeah, right now I, I'm, I'm very fond of these things because it's the best way to um, replicate something that I wanted to look very ancient but modern, mm -hmm. modern ancient. Yeah. So that's that's uh, what I do. I I want them to look um, like they've been worn, like you might unearth them from somewhere and go, oh my God, who who made these? You know, yeah. and people do say that. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's wonderful. Well, it's wonderful they look, the way they, they look like they've been buried for centuries. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah Wendy, I, I must admit, I, I have learned a lot just watching you uh, build up from the beginning the way you are so fearless, the way you begin an armature and use a lot of materials that I've, I've used before, but I never thought of using them the way you do. And, well, and I, I remember Mark Bradford saying something like in a New Yorker article, he said, if it's not at Home Depot, I don't need it. And I thought, hey, <laughs> hey, if, if he can do it, I can do it. And I would go to Home Depot and say, well, I could make the arms out of this, you know, so I, I do that and I save stuff and, you know. Because your stuff but, is very permanent. I mean, those materials could probably... Uh, sit outside for years and you could yeah, i have one of them outside here <laughs> yeah. so you're saying you could rebury them yeah you can bury them <laughs> yeah. now. That and they're, really they're mounted people. in rocks yeah. they may last yeah. longer than my bronzes i don't know they might I, you know. they'll be here longer than we are i'm sure of that yeah. yeah but i wanted to ask you something eugene that um but i remember i told you this the other day and i want but you didn't get a chance to answer it I brought a friend of mine to your studio and we were looking at all the um, pieces that you have in clay that from which you got the bronzes. And um, she said to me, and I hadn't really seen it until she said it, she said, all the eyes are kind. <laughs> so no matter what you do, it's still, I, do, do, is that a conscious thing? Uh, you know, it is tricky thing doing eyes because you know if you it's it's sort of it's a little bit like painting it's like painting with with clay because if you do it if you make it too mechanical it will feel dead but if you just leave it a little painterly and you kind of suggest it and you do a little less people can read into it and their brain or their eyes fill in 
what you haven't done and imagine the rest. And, and I find that that kind of a solution seems to work best. But yeah. it is interesting, you know, that somebody is focused on eyes because I mentioned, uh, I think it was yesterday, somebody was in my studio and said that they thought that I had a nose fetish. And I said, <laughs> you know, actually, I think I probably have a lip fetish, you know, because I mean, I just get into every single part of the, you know, the facial anatomy is such a unique thing that it can be interpreted so many different ways. So, uh, yeah, it's just... It's so interesting that you refer to it as painterly, and I know I connect to that, you know, so, so I'm just hearing sort of these layers, you know, all these layers that are in your work, you know, like, really, uh, you do give it the spirit, and then you evidently you know your anatomy you know so that's in there and you painstakingly you know uh create that and then this painterly i i really respond to that i i uh studied a little you know a little bit of of the history of sculpture you know and and love carpo you know and, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah well you went to tyler that. right you i did go to tyler so I'm so I'm from Philadelphia. So I actually I went, took a couple classes at Tyler, and then I I taught there for one semester too. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> small world. Yeah, yeah, small world. Well, I was lucky enough to get a, a workshop from both of you. I've been in workshops of both of you. And I remember in yours, Eugene, where I was having trouble with an ear and you came over and you said, oh, that's the, and then you knew the anatomical part. It's just maybe a quarter of an inch thicker. And I'm like, whoa, this guy, this guy knows all the parts of the ear. Too much and, information. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was great. I mean, I hadn't really thought of it like that. And I remember, June, in the flag workshop you had all of us doing, you know, all the different ways that people put things together and that you orchestrated in the nicest way, you know, to make people let go of stuff and do their own flag. It was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. You know, speaking of flags, I remember when I was looking through your work, June, along with the flags, and I think it was at one of the galleries, there was, I believe it was also a flag, but it was different in that it was draped rather than a flat flag. And I believe it was the 54th uh, Regiment of Cranley or Cragley. Uh, it's yeah. actually Carney, William H. Carney, yes. Right, and, and so that's, it was that one, but it was the other one that I saw that got my attention. It was kind of a hanging one. Yeah, it you know. Like it been hung from two points. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, and, so. And mm -hmm. I, I just, you know, I was so intrigued by it that I thought, well, I just wonder what the inspiration for that was. And so I, I looked it up and I found that it was this, um, uh, he was a soldier, Carney. Yes. And, and that he had saved the flag and there was a yes. wonderful story behind that. Isn't it great? Flag. And, and I, I think first it appealed to me because it was sculptural in nature. Oh. And, yes, and secondly, yeah. secondly, because it had a classical drapery kind of factor to it that was um, mm -hmm. it was very interesting. It has a sheen like it might be satin. Yeah, and it's quite asymmetrical, but it was just the way it hung. And uh, I just thought that, that is so amazing that you can take something, uh, some inspiration from a person or from a historical, um, you know, enactment or, or something, war or battle or whatever, and, and that can be the basis for a piece of artwork that looks nothing like the person right. or anything else, any, you know, even a, a uniform or even a flag for that matter. I mean, it just is, it's like this hanging sculpture that's um, just feels a, a little dark and, and ominous, but uh, very sculptural and, and curious. Yeah, June, I want to jump in here for a second. This is Amy, and I, I've been um, seeing some great comments, uh, questions in the chat and the Q&A, and I just wanted to 
bring that carny piece back up? There's lots of questions. Everybody's got tons of questions, but there were a few questions for June. And one of them was that this piece looks like a tapestry and somebody had a question about it being a, is it a painting? So I, I think you could start there. We had a question from Kimberly Ayers about having you speak to moving from painting to mosaics. And then Katie also asked that a lot of your work resembles mosaics. Um, in many mediums and what inspires you to go for the same sort of aesthetic with different mediums or why not stick with one of them? Thank you. Yeah, you know, so uh, the these drape flags, they're on a really lightweight canvas. So like a, a seven ounce canvas, you know, and they're unprimed and they're painted directly on you know, with, uh, with Nova color, you know, with the acrylic paint. And so it really soaks up the paint and, and it just looks like this when it dries, it kind of looks like leather. I've heard, you know, uh, it looked rubbery, you know, so it's just the, the, uh, mixing of those, of those two mediums, you know, so it's unprimed and it's, and it's really stained uh in in a way you know but i i do put a, i do saturate the surfaces with the paint and then on the back sides you know i i spray paint you know just black paint on those and uh as far as the mosaics go you know um i got into mosaic when i did a public art work okay so i did a public art commission in the 90s the early 90s uh in long beach and it was with mta and mta said you know uh had as, as a stipulation that your artwork had to last for at least 25 years and then they gave some suggestions and you know tile mosaic uh at the time uh uh enamel on, on metal was an option. And so I had gone to Mexico, you know, like maybe the year before. And, uh, and the story is, you know, we, I was traveling with some people and one person we were with was like late and I was trying to get to the Museum of uh, Anthropology. And I, and I really wanted to go, but we didn't get there till like four o'clock. So I'm just like in front of the museum, just really mad. And this, and this uh, cab driver sees me, you know, and he comes right to me and he says, do you want a tour of the University of Mexico? I was like, mm-hmm. And, and, and can you show us some art? He's like, I can show you some art that nobody else will. I was like, come on guys, get in the car. We're gonna take this tour. And he made good on his promise. And, uh, and I saw some Venetian glass mosaic, uh, 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 mosaic pieces. You know, of course, you know, I saw the great ones from uh, Siqueiros and Orozco, you know, those were there but from uh, some lesser known artists as well and some really, really beautiful pieces that were like in small verandas that you could tell hardly anybody saw. So it was, it was really special. And uh, when I found out that MTA was, was uh, looking for people to apply, I thought, man, it would be amazing to do it in this medium. So I was connected with a mosaicist in LA. Her name is Monica Sharp of Sharp and Sharp, and she's outstanding. And, um, and she did most of the fabrication, but it was her goal to uh, make the uh, mosaic look painterly. I was like, oh, you're gonna do that as well? You know, so she kind of taught me how to do that. And, you know, it, it's just, uh, I'm just attracted to it. You hear, you see, I'm with Eugene's sculpture. It's like, oh yeah, it's painterly, you know? So <laughs> it's painterly because it looks like it's got these breast strokes on it, you mm -hmm. know? So, so I'm just attracted to that. Yeah, that's nice when, when, I mean, a lot of times I don't have that opportunity because people, you know, a lot of, a lot of people like things really finished 
Sure. And, and, and so and we saw well, that in your gallery, you know, yeah, so when it, we go to your website and we see the work that you like doing. That's when you're yeah. letting it go. <laughs> That, yeah, that was difference. awesome to see. Big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. I was going to ask that question, but I don't need to, because all I do is <laughs> I was going to ask you, you know, what kind of work do you do when you're not, you know, doing a commission? So sure. I, yeah. I well, recommend people to go to people's It's like work. night and day, the difference. Yeah, you know, um, you they're have playful, the one of the guy reading. Accurate, you know, they're, ex they're exaggerated, they're, they're not really bright in any way it or, awesome or it looks like you're having fun it looks like you're having a good time yeah i am, I am uh, well june i wanted to ask you you because you teach how do you navigate that difference you know where when you say for fun i don't know i mean do you have like for fun or do you have do you, I mean, where is it in the process that you decide everything I'm doing is for a series or, I mean, do you just fiddle around or does it not, um, do you turn up that creative self off when you're, t I don't, I don't understand how people teach. Basically, either of you could answer well, this. Uh, teaching is fun, you know, it's, it's fun, you know, because, because what I like, about, I'm teaching young ones right now. And so what's fun about teaching young ones is that you could bring whatever you saw, you know, yesterday into the classroom and, and experiment with it and show it to the kids and, and, and they'll have fun with it. You know, so for instance, like having the conversation with the two of you, you know, so it's like, oh, I see how you're putting that tape around, you know, I didn't know that blue tape, you know, and, and, and I think kids can handle that, you know, uh, you know, so just sort of getting ideas and, and, and really having that opportunity to bring it into the class. And, uh, and that, and that has, is what I've been doing, you know, for the past, you know, few years. I hope I'm asking, am I answering your question? Yeah, I, yeah, I just, I, I mean, do you, when you're in your studio, is there stuff that happens to you when you're teaching that has kind of informed you in your own work? Absolutely. Or, yeah. Absolutely. You know, like, especially when I first started teaching young ones, you know, and, I was hearing myself say things for the first time. You know, I was teaching myself at the same time. You know, so I was wanting, I see you nodding, Peggy, like, yeah. 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 you know, and I said, and you just, and, and so, and so you want to go work it out. Or even if you see a kid do something and it's like, what, how did they do that? You know, and you yeah. try to do that at home and fail, you know, but, um, but it's, you, you do get inspired uh, by the students and, and by uh, something new, but, but sort of working in the series, I hear, I hear what you're asking. So working in the series, you know, uh, believe it or not, a, a lot of it is uh, improvisational. It's super improvisational. So that, you know, when laying down the colors, you know, uh, like I have a little bit of plan and then I work that in and add improvisation. And then when, when all that's done, then it's just straight, you know, improvisation to, to bring it together, you know, and to, and hopefully to sort of give it life and, and break some of the, the pattern, you know, so, uh, so that is, that's so interesting. I, I, I think, you know, at this point, things are, you know, I was listening to an artist talk earlier this week, where the, where the artist was just saying, there's just no words. It's, it's in my body, you know, me knowing yeah. this, my understanding, this is just in my body. And I, and I loved, you know, the way uh, that 
uh, Alexander said Alexander said that. So that is so it's kind of that now. It's it's just not as conscious. Can I interject one more time? We have a lot of questions out here, and I know you have lots of questions for each other. Wendy, there's some questions for you about um, your inspiration or your ideas about bringing in the natural elements that you work with and the bird series. Um, if you could talk maybe to the inspiration of that, that would be great. And oh. I have questions for Eugene, so just let me know when I can jump in again. Oh, sure. You know, I get ideas for what I'm doing when I'm doing something else. And I don't know, again, there is that body part. There, there, you know, the, there's um, that saying that we're human beings, not human doings. I don't know how that works because the being and doing is ever, I, I think those of us who do creative work, it just is like you said, in the body or mm -hmm. I, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I, I'm very interested in ancient myths. And the reason I am is that it's not just a telling of a myth, it's what the myth has happened to it in all its variation over time. And so that to me is like a really big part of, I guess I'm trying to work out for myself and I have this agenda that I want people to see that change is inevitable, that we never get ground under our feet. It's always slipping. These are old stories. I mean, where we are in the world now. So this is one of the pieces. I have 40 of them. And they're all on bases that are the place we come from. They're all made with um, what's called devil's claw pods. And then they're polymer clay. So they go from, they, they carry all the different DNA of a, a chimera. You know, they're, they're a plant. They kind of go into insect and then they become a bird. Um, but the name of the series is called We Are All the Same. And all of them are different, but they are all the same. And I feel really strongly about that right now in our world. Um, and I hope that it's done in such a way that people aren't feeling like I'm lecturing them, that they're interesting to look at. Beautiful, um, very beautiful. Those are amazing. I love, the, I love the texture, the way you weave, you go from that organic plant thing into your own uh, sculptural uh, variations and it just feels kind of seamless it doesn't uh, in, in no way it, it just all kind of blends and, and keeps moving but it has a yeah. organic quality to it and yet it's totally under your control and you manage to do what you want with it I've been collecting old table legs and cutting them up and those are the bases for everything. So all of us come from a different kind of background. Some of us are rich, some of us have high one, you know, so some are elaborate, but we are all the same. So uh, that's a big deal to me. And the other series that I'm working on right now, um, the reliquaries in process, because I'm also interested in ancient things that we do um, to commemorate what's been, these are going to be reliquaries. The tree is for the American chestnut that's disappeared. And those of you who know what medieval and Renaissance reliquaries know that there's always a, a little window and it's usually got the saint in it. But these are secular. Um, the, they're, they're in that phase before they get the epoxy. Um, and I've got some, the, <clears throat> the figure down in front is a bee, uh, a, that will be a thing for the oh. deformation of bees. <clears throat> so you can kind of see there's a beginning of uh, a bee skep for her head, and I've been making the wings. But all of them will carry an actual item or a, a little piece of the thing that, that uh, I'm doing. I have one for flowers and fish. Um, and, and the point is, is that these, in my opinion, are the actual saints. You know, we've been so busy thinking about other humans as saints. I feel that the real saints, the ones that we've martyred, are in the world. So um, I have a real point of view about everything I do. And I, but what I notice over time is it always gets back to this same thing of taking an older idea and pulling it forward, but still making it look kind of old. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it any yeah. better. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, W.S., um, 
you had shared in a conversation we were having previously that you were at home because you were avoiding your studio. And I think I, I could certainly relate to this. And it's just, I'm interested to know what's going on when something, what's happening in your process when something's, when that's happening. You know, there's something not, you know, not going the way you want it to or whatever. No. Um, generally, it's that I fucked something up three or four times. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I'm going home. You know, and until I get over whatever the snit fit is that I'm having about it. And I dream on it or I'm taking a shower or something. And then I go, oh, I, could fi I know how to fix it now. You know, so um, I like to say I fail forward. You know, I make yeah. mistakes, and but I think that's kind of the process, maybe. I, you know? That's what I mean. I think it is part of the process. I absolutely you know. But I, but I hit a point where I think, well, you know what? This is stupid. I'll never be able to do it again. Then I know to just go home, you know, and try and be nice to my husband, you know, and not yeah. take it out on anybody <laughs> else that I'm frustrated. But mm -hmm. I, I would assume we all have that. I mean, am I right, June and Eugene? In the I like to tell my students, I, I tell them, fail faster, fail right away. I mean, get her <laughs> open, you know, just get right in there and fail immediately and just keep doing it. And then you can just kind of get on with it. Yeah. There you go. Good advice. Yeah. That's good advice. <laughs> we, need to do a, a, we need to do a workshop in your studio next. You need to give us a workshop on I don't think I could be a teacher. Process. No? I, 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 I admire teachers, you know. I, um, before I got into doing my own art, you know, I did exhibits and, um, and uh, I art directed. Uh, and I was always like frustrated if people didn't absolutely get it, you know, and you guys have that in you. So, Amy, you were going to ask something of somebody? Thanks, thanks so much. Thanks so much. So, Jean, there's a lot of questions out here for you, too. Um, I think the big ones um, that I see are um, someone's really intrigued by your Rosa Parks piece, you know, a heroine, but quietly accessible. Um, and she said it, it kind of up upends in a good way for me our perception of heroism. Can you speak to that a little bit? Did, were you thinking about that when you were thinking about this piece? Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, I, th I think everyone remembers Rosa Parks for, for that iconic moment you know, when she wouldn't give up the seat. And I remember struggling uh, in the proposal for that, uh, for a way to do that and, and not do the obvious, which would be to put her in a bus seat and, uh, yeah. and how to do that yeah. in, in, a, in a more symbolic way. And so I think finally what, what it, it came to, and for some reason I've always been, um, uh, interested in these figures emerging. I think it went all the way back to Michelangelo's slaves, where he started to carve these figures and he never finished. He, I don't know whether he didn't get to it or whether he just decided that he'd said enough and, and they were done. But to me, they were so magical because they were, they were emerging. And so I think that's what kind of gave me the idea to have her emerging from a seat without showing any seat at all. And that way it sort of gave her the, the rootedness and the, and the you know, stability and the anchor of, of that statement without putting cushions and rails and all the obvious things. It gives it, it, gives it a story. Mm -hmm. I mean, you gave that the story in process with her doing that. It's yeah. beautiful. Thank you. Her face is just so... It, it, well, she it was just... a beautiful woman. She really was. I mean, she had a wonderful face. And she did have such a, a wonderful, kind uh, and calm expression. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, what you try to, try to go for. Yeah. I think you kind of fall in love with your pe the people you do. that you're Absolutely. sculpting. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're very right about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, there you go. There she is. Yeah. And it so fits what you were trying to do, which is the emerging, you know? Yeah. It was, what a change she brought. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, trying to avoid the obvious, I think, and, and not get uh, tied up with, uh, with details that, that just weren't, were not that important. I think if you, you look at her, you see her sitting with holding her purse, and you get it. You don't need any more information. Mm -hmm. than that. Any more would almost get in the way and become trivial. And her back is so straight. <laughs> yeah. You know, she was tired, but her posture is queenly, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah I love that. Yeah. There's a hole uh, on the back, originally on the back of her sculpture, was the whole conversation between uh, her and the bus driver. Mm. Almost like a, like, a, uh, like you would see a, a script for a play, you know, bus mm. driver, now y'all give up those seats, Rosa. Uh, I will not blah 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 and on and on the whole exchange between her and the bus driver and I was really thought that would be a nice touch but um, in the end I, I guess it, they were afraid they'd offend the bus driver unions or something like that <laughs> so they just decided to not do that at all and, uh, and, and the front of, on the front of it on the, on the name it had Rosa Parks the spark that ignited the modern civil rights movement. And that became a, a, a big issue too. It was like, well, was she the spark? Was she one of the sparks? Was she, you know, whatever. And again, uh, no one could agree. So it all got taken off and it was just like Rosa Parks date. <laughs> that was wow. it. <laughs> wow. So, and that's okay, you know. Yeah. Um, Eugene, one other question. Um, Judy was wondering about the work with the military and the movie industry about creating the Bob Hope Memorial in San Diego. Um, if you could maybe share a little bit more about that. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the, the movie industry. The, the whole idea with that uh, Bob Hope tribute in San Diego was uh, his service to the troops during the Second World War. And uh, uh, the, the, the many times, you know, he traveled to entertain them. And, um, and so uh, there was a central figure of Bob Hope. And then there were, I think, 14 other figures. And those figures were split up between um, uh, my team and uh, Stephen White, who was a, a sculptor from, I think, Carmel or something. And so he did... Uh, half of the servicemen and we did the other half of the servicemen. And so what they were, the servicemen were uh, uh, various soldiers from different wars. So you would have uh, somebody from the second world war, somebody from the first world war, you would have uh, all the, 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 the different people. You had the, the Tuscaloosa airmen were, were one. You would have uh, a disabled person. So it, it was really a mishmash to represent all the services uh, and from uh, all the way from the Second World War all the way up to Vietnam and, that, and Afghanistan actually too. So uh, it was an interesting project. Yeah. And so he, uh, uh, I think it, it, in the end, he was just sort of standing there uh, holding court with, with the troops and, and they were all sort of responding and laughing and clapping. And, and it's a wonderfully interactive thing. I, every time I go down there, it's fun to watch people uh, sort of sitting on the lap of somebody and having their picture taken. And, and <laughs> you know, parts of the sculpture are rubbed shiny from uh, uh, interaction, you know, with, with different pieces. It's fun to watch. Well, I have to say, Eugene, that I love the the giant hacks that you did with Michael oh, Davis out in that yeah. park in Burbank. I mean, so people think of you as like this figure, you know, <laughs> and there there were these giant hats, and we could sit on the brims. That, that was a hat. that was a fun project. Yeah, yeah, that and was Michael. Cool. Michael came up with a, a wonderful hat. Of course, we you know we 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 both worked on all three of them. But uh, uh, he, in particular, came up with the, with the Lincoln hat, which was uh, uh, really, really wonderful. But we, we both had a lot of fun. Uh, so were you asked to do hats? Were you, were you, was the job to do hats? No, the, did job you come up with that? the job was to represent Lincoln Park. 
and that's <laughs> where it started. And I think we, um, trying to remember back now, uh, we came up with the idea of doing a, I think it was a Lincoln hat. And, and when we proposed the thing, somebody liked the idea of hats. And so we thought, well, why don't we do all hats? And so uh, we, we tried to figure, uh, it, was, it had to do with California history. And so we came up with the idea to do a straw hat and that would represent um, all the laborers who toiled in the sun in, in that part of the country, the, the people who picked and planted and, and did all the farm work and they all, you know, needed protection from the sun. So that represented a huge group of people who labored in, in that area. Uh, and, and, then, uh, and then Amelia Earhart, we chose because she flew out of the Burbank airport. That's great. And, no, it's great. I think it's fantastic. What a and, great and idea. Chris Lincoln have. was because of, you know, it was called Lincoln Park. And so we thought, okay, well, you know, so we had, instead of the people, we just used a hat. So it was Amelia Earhart's helmet with the goggles. And, and we wanted something interactive. The kids could kind of, you know, climb on and walk under. And, and of course, the straw hat you can sit on. And Lincoln's hat you can sit on, too. So it was, it was a really That's a great. fun job. <laughs> Thanks for thinking of that. That's I, yeah. great. Right. That was that was really not in my wheelhouse, but uh, yeah. it's still a lot. Of fun. It was beautiful. Yeah. They were uh, they were at fun too. Yeah, right. they were. Yeah, we had a good time with that. Yes. So W S, I wanted to ask you when when do you you know what it is you're going to make? Do you know when you begin? Working, or you just start playing with materials, and and uh, and and it happens as you go. Um, well, you know, um, when I was an undergraduate, I was a medievalist, I, I medieval literature, and I've always had this fascination for things, uh, what people have believed through time, um, mm -hmm. and so I've I've always had it in the back of my mind that I wanted to work on those things the um but i go in fact this is something i want to ask both june and eugene when i get to a place where i i know i have an idea but i don't know how how to address it i like will go to museums and just walk around by myself and look at stuff and some and and i don't know exactly what I'm doing or why. Likewise, there's that place on um, Pacific Avenue here in San Pedro, House. And sometimes mm. if I'm having a hard time, I'll just go in there and walk around. It's like this visual ocean and it's so uncharted. And I just walk through and I look at stuff and I think, well now there's an interesting piece that would make a great arm. Or I look at somebody's brush strokes and paintings and think, Oh yeah, that's it. That I want something to lift off, um, and I and I come to it. It takes me a little bit of time. I mean, those um, the Devil's Claw. A friend sent me oh maybe five years ago, and I've had these Devil's Claw around. And I didn't know what I was going to do with them. You know, I mean, do you guys find? Do you go certain places if you need a day of inspiration? Do you find yourselves going uh, a particular place, or is it always different? Or Mm -hmm. well, yeah. uh, for, for me, I will go to museums, you know, I'll just take a day, you know, just take a day and go to shows and, you know, galleries, you know, just like a whole day like that, because that doesn't happen that often, you know, with working and all that. So, so that is just always, it's always invigorating, you know, but but I look at a lot of art online, you know, for prepping for teaching. Or I just look at a lot of art online and I'll see something, you know, that, that, you know, I just look at and I'm just like, how did they do this? You know, like, how did they do this? I want to do something like this, you know, and, and that, that'll, that'll get me on something for like years, you know, and I'll be in my sketchbook, you know, trying to work it out. You know, the, the pieces that I fell in love with the years when I first saw them were those medieval little reliefs that you did, Wendy, those, uh, 
Right, because I, I started doing little diptychs and triptychs based on um, little uh, miniatures inside manuscripts. But as a friend of mine said, they are medieval with a twist, you know, because what I found is that even though I try to copy them, um, I'm a modern artist and I make things in a modern way. My faces don't look medieval. You know, you know how the medieval things have that, those strange bodies sometimes that come down and then there's that like, I don't know, it looks like they're a bulb almost, the bottom part of their bodies and unhappy. And, and I can do that, but it comes out differently. They and still through, have a wonderful medieval flavor to them though. Well, they do because of the, the colors. And I usually work from, um, uh, I, I usually use pigments that I grind up myself because it's easier to get that flat, medieval, gouache kind of quality to things, that egg tempera look. Um, although sometimes I use acrylics as well, uh, but that took some experimenting. And sometimes I'll have an acrylic and I'll add in the dry pigments, you know, to just give it like, because you know, when you go to a museum and you look closely, those are really flat pieces. But I, I started those and then I started carving they, them a little more and then they, they started to turning them. They seem to have a little relief to them also. Yeah, and that's what happened. And I have, um, I started going to swap meets and buying pieces of old jewelry and using those in them to make it look old or to add a piece of it because I didn't like any of the stamps that you buy or any of those like things that they give you to make pattern or mm -hmm. the, I, they all bore me. I, I was like, I don't want to do that. I want it to, so I, I misuse or whatever you call it, um, things I find. I have a lot of stuff that I use rocks on or seashells. Are you because, drawing on the clay? Because it does, they do have that relief. Do you draw, yeah, I draw, literally draw yeah. on the clay and give it, get a pillowed effect or? Um, yeah, I, well, you know, in those ones, those are polymer clay. And I know polymer clay has a way to give and take. So I can draw into it and push it down and use it just like you do with other clays. Yeah. You know, I can, I can make that work. And if I'm working in a small enough segment, but then they start getting even more of a relief and more of a relief. And then I thought, well, Wendy, why don't you just do sculpture? Like, <laughs> what <are> you... <laughs> like okay. this is what, and, and you know, I started in theater. So costumes and sets, everything's three dimensional. So I think that's just what, after a long hiatus, I got back to sculptural pieces. Cause I like to walk around things. Yeah. Well, I think relief is, is sort of, in some ways it's the perfect transition between, you know, uh, graphics and sculpture. Yeah. It's just uh, yeah. Uh, profiles that begin to take on a life of their own and they begin to come off the surface. And before you know, if you go high enough, you're, you're in three dimension. Yeah. And I guess looking at the ancient reliefs too. I'll go to the Getty and look at some ancient stuff from Smyrna or something and I'll see those reliefs and I'll go, oh, that's how they did it. I bet I could do that this way, you know, so I'm always, um, like June was saying with, with looking at stuff, I'm always looking at, and I'm going, oh, I guess I view like a cannibal, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I could, I could totally eat that. I can, <laughs> I, this I can do, you know, I'm never uh, without, when I look at things now, I look at it differently, you know, I, I guess that's, it's different than words, and yet I want a story like what you did with Rosa Parks and what you do, June, with the flags. There's stories there. Yeah, I was wondering about your narrative, you know, because you're you're using these ancient stories, yet you, even in the process, they contemporize. So what kind of comes first? Like the the uh, retelling of the narrative or changing the narrative or, or is it just the method that you're retelling? You know, how does that occur? Mm, I'm not sure. You know, that's so uh, internal. I, I will tell you a big change that I've made in, in 
this series I'm doing now, when the COVID happened and we were all shut down, I went through this phase of binge watching television and watching all these shows. And eventually I was like, oh my God, get me out of here. Every procedural has the same kinds of qualities and look to it. It's not the story so much as the way things look visually. So I quit it and I listen to books, audio books, because I can make up my own images. And through that, I've been listening to, you know, the retelling of a bunch of different myths about, you know, Agamemnon and Clytemnestra and, you know, Achilles. And, um, and in my own imaginings, what I notice is this um, thing about dark and light, dark and light, dark and light. In the same way that the deciduous gods, there's the ambivalent side to the god, and then there's the more benevolent side, but they're never for or against you, really. They just don't care. And so all these images and all these stories, I think what I'm looking for in the background is the idea that we are part of some bigger thing. I won't call it a plan, but it isn't about us. I think that's what I'm looking for in all of those pieces and what I'm trying to do is that it's about us, but it isn't really about us. We're just here for this brief time. And um, I, I, I don't know, it just, all these pieces that I do are somehow a part of that narrative. That's the narrative, ultimately. It's like, look what these people believe, look what those people believe, but here's what we believe, and they're all the same thing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Did I say that okay? I, I never I, perfect. <laughs> Except I can't do ears, Eugene. <laughs> really you, can't do ears. Don't worry about it. You don't need you to do, do ears. Do you guys look at art mostly online or do you find that you have magazines you look at? Are are we have we all crossed online. over? Online. What about I like you? Books too. Sometimes I get yeah, books. I, I have books. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I still love print, you know, and I mean, I, I, you know, I get the New York Times on Sunday and there are so many ex exciting images that I, I could just work for two weeks just based on one New York Times mm -hmm. by the time you go through the, you know, the arts and leisure and the review and, and uh, it, it's just amazing. There's... I get so many ideas from those images and those stories also. Yeah. Eugene, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about your coins, you know, the coins that you make. You know, how, how big are they? And what are they made out of? Well, they, you know, there's, there's a couple different kinds of coins. There's the kind that we have, you know, like money that we carry in our pocket. That's a type of relief and, and that those are akin to these small coins that you see up in the top there. And that's a, a little series of uh, euros that I just did for the French mint. And so in that case, they're done first large. And these, you see these plaster uh, models and they are about, oh, I'd say about nine inches in diameter. And if you look on the left there, you'll see the original clay and then from that clay, I'll cast a, a plaster, which is the middle. And you can see a little uh, note there. I'm calling that the first negative. Oh. So then I work in that negative and clean it up a little bit, and refine it. And then I put a band around that and I pour plaster against that, which produces the next one to the right there, which is a, a positive plaster. And then I continue to refine that. And then when I'm finished refining that, then I, uh, that's what gets sent to the mint, to the French mint. And then from that, they then scan it, make a die, which is much, much smaller. And, uh, and from that die, they stamp these gold euros. And uh, wow. so, it's, so that's the way it's done with the struck metal. Now there's, there's different kinds of metals. There's art metals. And with art metals, many times is I'll just make a, a, a sculpture the same size and then just make a mold and cast that. And, and um, 
have get a wax and go to the, the foundry and cast the same size, you know. But the difference is I have to do it small, so I don't have the luxury of going through that whole uh, process of reducing. And the process of reducing, the biggest advantage to that is you're able to make ultra refinements and you're able to uh, do lettering and, and, uh, and then when it's reduced, it's, it's very crisp and tight. Yeah. And, you know, where, where art metals are more arty and, and loose and can be anything and don't, they don't even have to be round. They can be square, they can have a hole in them, or they can uh, be amorphous in any way. And so again, that's that's the the fun part of making coins and metals is the uh, you have the commission type like the ones for the French mint, and then and then I do a lot of them that are simply just for fun for me people that I want to to do, and um, you know I'm, I'm just just finished a Bukowski medal. Uh, oh I'm right, fun with now, and so it's it's a it's a fun thing because it. It, it goes a lot quicker than making a, a, a full-size sculpture. So you can make a statement very quickly. You, know, you can just sit, I could just sit down in an afternoon and sculpt a little art metal and by mm. the next day have something in wax that I could either make a mold in ceramic or I can, I can have it cast in bronze. Uh, and I have a lot of different options that way. So it's a wonderful, flexible medium. Here's a question from the attendees. Most of you are single discipline artists. How do you feel about artists that multimedia? Um, do you feel that, do, I'm gonna read the rest of the question because it's great. Do you feel like that makes you a dilettante if you use too many materials? Um, <laughs> so Wendy is multimedia. She sure yeah. is. Yeah, I am multimedia and, and I also am a writer. So yeah. Yeah, yes, and there's a part of me when I, on bad days where I think, well, you're just a dilettante, you know, <laughs> but, but I, I think we have this idea that to do, to be an artist, you pick one thing. And I don't think yeah. that's true. Yeah. I, I just, it, it's it, we, a lot of us move all over the place all the time. Yeah. You know, I, I love materials. I mean, I, I just have more fun going from, uh, working in cardboard, working in paper, working in wax, working in ceramic. Uh, I just love to be all over the place and just keep trying different things. I, it's just so much yeah. fun. No, I mean, it's somewhat, I mean, it makes me want to say, what's wrong with being a dilettante anyway? Who cares? It's just something you call somebody, you know. And it's French. <laughs> it's French. <laughs> and it's French. <laughs> <laughs> Eugene, this is a very specific question. I also have a question for Wendy, um, but I think it's really for both of you, a couple of you. Um, Eugene, did you sand with a thousand grit on plaster to create such a smooth surface? And how do you see, keep the surface so perfectly flat? I think that they're talking about your coins. You know, um... Actually, I do, I do use uh, sandpaper. I, I cut it up in little tiny strips. And, um, and I, use, uh, I usually use 100 grades, you know, 100, sometimes 150. If I, if I want to go fast, I'll start out a little coarser. I, I don't usually ever go down below uh, 250, though, because it's... Uh, at that size, remember I'm working nine inches, and from nine inches, it it's going all the way down to maybe an inch or two. So it's like I remember my uh, first career was in graphics, and and when you had drew something, you always drew it larger, maybe five, ten times bigger, and that way you could you could be pretty loose and rough. But by the time it reduced, it tightened up and looked very comprehensive. And the same thing is true with, with sculpture. So I don't really have to make it all that smooth, um, you know. But again, after, uh, after 200 in plaster at that size, it doesn't make any difference. You could keep polishing it. It wouldn't make any difference because you're reducing anyway. So uh, Great. 
thank you so much for sharing that. So I think the last question I have um, from the audience that really could go to all of you, um, but what started with Wendy, having seen exhibits of your work, um, this person is charmed not only by your art, but also by the legends you write to go with them. And how do these evolve? And do the rest of you write to go with your pieces? Is there some written piece that goes along with it? And then we'll close this thing up. Uh, yeah, I know the story of, I, I have like five or six stories that I want to turn into a sculpture. And um, I know them and they're an amalgam of things I've read uh, or now listened to. Um, and, um, and, all, and to me, it is all narrative. Um, I, that's the best way I can explain it. But um, yeah, the, the story is everything because I mean, what I admire in what you do, June, is that you, there's a huge story behind everything you do and it's just there in front of you. I mean, and, and it's not didactic. I think that's the other thing is that all three of us, what I see similar in all three of us is that each of us tells a story, but we tell it in a way that you can tell it to yourself. You know, it, the, the observer gets to tell their version of that story, just like the eyes you read in. Um, but I actually put beside my pieces, these things that look like faux Getty things, you know, because they look ancient. I've always wanted to do an exhibit where we just take everyday objects and it put little things on. This was a lamp from the blah, 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 that they believed, you know, I, because there is something about that whole curatorial thing, but mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, the story. I mean, aren't we all storytelling with all this stuff? I think so. Say something, guys. Yeah, okay. I think so. You know, well, writing is, is probably my, my, weakest, my weakest link, but I, I do, when I do medals, and I design, when I'm designing my own medals, and I can work in um, some, some kind of uh, words or something like that. I, I mean, I always love letter forms from the time I, I worked in graphics. And so to me, that's a real opportunity to work in some kind of wording into a, into a metal. But as far as writing, uh, <laughs> no thanks, can't do that. June, I, I, before you did the flags, you did the kind of mandala paintings. And, um, and prior to that, your work was figurative. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm just fig interested to know how you, did you make a decision? My work is not going to be figurative. It's going to be abstract. How did that happen? I, 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 I think I just had an inclination to do some abstract works. Mm -hmm. you know, so it wasn't, at the time, it wasn't a declaration like I'm an abstract artist now. You know, so I did that, and and then after I did this this series of abstract works, I did some really figurative drawings. You know, just like super figurative. It was like I was teaching myself, you know, how to even do that. And then, um, and then you know, so it just sort of comes, you know. So then after that, sort of the the uh, the colorful abstracts that, that you're referring to, mm -hmm. you know, just came with this one idea, you know, just to do this one circle. And then I wanted to do them. And I did one and I wanted to do them in all colors. And then I wanted to over, you know, so it just sort of grew, you know. Yeah. Uh, I was curious about your, your painting um, about, uh, was it the Ohio and Miss Gardner, was it, I believe? The woman yes. who was in Toni Morrison's novel, yes. that theme. And I was yes. just so curious. That was such a powerful story. It is. And I was it? curious how you interpreted that into a totally abstract piece with the circles. Yeah. And yeah. how do you get there? That's so fascinating to yeah. me. Yeah, you know, so I did that piece. That's the piece that I was only in Paducah, Kentucky for one month. So I did that whole piece there, you know, and uh, where I was in Kentucky, you know, just sort of the geography I was in, I was just, 
you know, once I got there, I, I got interested in, in what the history was in that area. You know, I'd always uh, been interested in sort of the time that slavery ended, but before, right before it ended, and then after it ended, and then uh, Reconstruction. So, uh, so right before it ended, because of the kinds of uprisings that, you know, that the enslaved people were uh, uh, exercising, if you will. So, so Margaret Garner is from that area in Kentucky, you know, so where I was, I was uh, where the residency is was uh, maybe a mile and a half from the Ohio River, you know, oh, which is the Mason-Dixon line. And where Margaret Garner was, was maybe an hour away, you know, and that close to the river. And so it was, it was uh, just amazing to sort of stand at the bank of the river and, and feel that history and think about that history and what it meant, you know, 150 years ago to be standing there. You know what I mean? To just yeah. be standing there and... and, and you, you translate it into circles. Right. And so, so uh, Margaret Garner, for those that don't know the story of her, you know, she was enslaved and uh, had four children and was married to somebody who that, I don't think I have Margaret Garner at all. We wanted to share these, they're so great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, but she decided that, that she wanted to run away, you know, so she told her husband that was at a different plantation. Uh, he was able to visit her only once a week, you know, uh, that when the Ohio River freezes, that she was going to walk over, you know, into uh, Ohio, you know, to, to find her freedom. And so she did that. She took her four children, but because of uh, the the new ordinance that if even if you were in the north if somebody thought you were a slave that you know i'm forgetting the name of it but uh you would have to be returned to slavery because of that new law that uh that was put in place in uh like 1859 or 18 i think it's the fugitive slave act thank you oh. so the so anyway, so here she was in Ohio with her children in a safe house, but the slave owner came and uh, to retrieve her back. And so uh, she was just so serious about not being a slave or having her children have that same life, you know. Uh, she, she killed one of her children, you know. So they wouldn't have to go back into slavery, and so, and so that is what *Beloved* is loosely based off of. So, so it's sort of an interpretation of, of what mothers want for their children. You know, they want their children to be free. You know, and so I was sort of seeing those circles as as the spirits of her children that that were finally freed by her so that's okay yeah. all right yeah, that's 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 pretty amazing you know yeah. translate that uh into something that's that can manifest itself into a totally different uh, yeah kind of artwork i admire that i wish i could do that yeah. I know abstract art is really, I love it, and I wouldn't know how to begin, or I wouldn't know when I was done. <laughs> that's, that's one of the things that's tricky for me. <laughs> that's interesting. I want to thank all of you for all of the sharing you did tonight. Peggy, I know you have some comments here at the end. I would love to, um, but I would love to just thank all of you for the sharing you did tonight. Sure, yeah. Um, 
So, okay, so it's time for me to say goodbye, huh? Is that it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, listen, I just want to thank Eugene and WS and June so much. You guys are champions. I mean, you know, people really, I know people really love watching you interact and it was so genuine and so spontaneous. You know, I'm grateful. Uh, I certainly didn't have to worry about filling any gaps. Um, and I want to thank Amy and Judith and Angels Gate and also Harold Green for the music. It was beautiful. And Colleen for providing us with those images. Shall we all say good night? Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks you all. Thanks. Thanks. June. Thank you.